Welcome into the Cubs Talk Podcast brought to you by Tasty Works. Claire Philippi is at the controls. Tim Stebbins, Gordon Wittenmeyer, I'm David Kaplan. We got a lot to get to, gentlemen. Let's first talk about the news of the day is Tony La Russa is out indefinitely. It wouldn't shock me if he's if it's an indefinite out because of medical, yeah. then maybe he's done for the season. I don't know. We wish him well. Gordon, if Tony La Russa decides at age almost 78 to say, you know what, I'm going to step away. It, the rough year on my health, and I'm around if you guys want me to be a consultant, but I'm going to step away from the day-to-day, yeah. if that happens. Yeah. I'm not saying it will. Two former Cubs in play, Joe <laughs> Girardi, Joe Madden. What do you think? Yeah, I tell you what, and, and you know, I, I, I don't wish Tony Russo any, any harm. I hope, I hope the best for him. We don't know what this is, so hopefully it's not that serious. But it might not be the worst thing anyway. For him to step aside at this point, and 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 if he's having some health issues, I mean that's a very stressful job. I think Ozzy said that on the broadcast the other day. That takes a lot out of you. So maybe it's the right thing to do all the way around. And if it is, I think either one of those, Joe Madden, Joe Girardi, is is a Joe above. I think it's a I think it's a step up. I think it's an upgrade. And that and that's not to say that you know, Tony La Russa in his day was one of the best, if not the best, managers going. He hasn't proven that in today's game after being gone for a decade. But these other guys have had success recently. Mm-hmm. These other guys are fluent in today's game and have had a lot of success. And they're different kinds of managers. So depending on what you want, one of them might be exactly the, the right kind of fit. And by the way, I mentioned him, and he's not an ex-Cub, but Ozzy Gian. Well, that be the perfect guy, but that ain't going to happen. Right? Okay, so full disclosure, one of my closest friends is Joe Girardi. I love Joe Girardi. If I owned the team, I would hire Ozzy Gian. Yep. And I, and that's not a shot at my friend. Ozzy's that perfect like, to like, fit. Like if Ozzy said I'm not interested, then my next call would be to Joe Girardi. For me, yeah, that's not for everybody, but that's what I would do. But if Ozzy Gian truly would take the job, yes, I I think he's a perfect fit. In that situation. So, so you and I tangled on this as it related to the Cubs years ago, twice on Joe Girardi, once with Pinella and again with Madden, I believe. In both cases, I thought the Cubs did hire the right guy at the right time. And you said no, Girardi, I, certainly in the Pinella case. Yeah, the Joe Madden one, I don't disagree. Okay. The Joe, the um, Lou Pinella one, yeah, that I would not have made that higher. I think that, that, well, we disagreed on that. But in this case, between Madden and Girardi, where the, where the White Sox are right now and what they appear to need, I might be inclined to go with your guy. They need some structure. Over my Joe, you know, and, and, and a structure and a guy, I mean, he's not the best bullpen manager in the world. Actually, neither one of them are. Um, but, uh, you know, some of their metrics can take care of that as they, they manage the pockets of lineups and so on and so forth. But this team's ready to win right now. He's done it, and he's a, he's a guy that's managed veterans and, and uh, egos before uh, and has, uh, is a little bit more of a taskmaster than the other guy. And that, that might be what they need. What do you think, Tim? Yeah, I mean, obviously, first off, just echoing what you two said, oh, you, you hope for the best for Tony. It was kind of a scary thing last night. It was like less than an hour till first pitch when the, the news came out that he wasn't going to be managing the game at the discretion of his doctors. Um, in, in a general sense, like if you, you know, talk about that position, how it's been this year, going like what it would look like next year, the White Sox managing job, I feel like a lot of people have gone to A.J. Pruszynski just speculating, right, in terms of a former Sox player. We know he's a catcher. I mean, if we're talking about a Cubs connection, me and Gordon chatted about this offline, but Willie Harris is, he's in that kind of role now when, you know, third base coach, obviously bench coach is a position that you think manager with that, but also third base coach. We've seen it, I feel like, with other guys and former White Sox player who's on the 2005 team. He spoke to you in Colorado, was it in April? And he said it's definitely his goal is to become yeah, a manager. That's, that's what he wants. Although if you're the White Sox and you make this change now, you can't go with an unproven guy. You, Bingo. You have to go. They're they're 
position to win now. They've got a window that if they don't do this right is going to close on them way fast. Would you hire Bruce Bochy? I would. I, I brought that up in our conversation with Tim. Bochy would be one of my first calls. Bochy wants back in, and at the time that he left the game, was probably the best manager in the game. I will say, I think they. I mean, they interviewed Willie Harris. By the way, he's ten years younger than than Tony. Than Tony and and has had a lot of success recently. I think he's going to manage World Baseball Classic too, right? For France, is it? I believe Bruce Bochy. I think that's. Uh, I don't know. I hadn't seen that. Yeah, yeah he's going to manage. I know the Mark DeRose is uh, managing yeah. uh, the U.S. team. Pretty cool. That's a, actually that's a pretty good staff. They got King Griffey Jr. on the staff as a hitting coach. Hey, here, do it the way I did it. No, 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 no. Hit it farther than that. Like way out. Exactly. Every time. Every time, forty <laughs> feet over the fence. So we wish Tony all the best. Uh, it was just interesting that if there was any thought of making a change, that this gives him a graceful exit. Absolutely, and it's. Assuming again that this is nothing serious and that he gets through this and he's fine, it could be, it could be the best thing for all parties involved, based on what we've seen so far. Not to mention, possibly good for his family. All right. So moving from that, Tim, I have a couple of really dear friends that work for the Cardinals, yeah. and they have said to me, "Dude, your guy may end up being our catcher next season." I said, "Wilson Contreras." PJ said, Higgins. Yeah, exactly. Uh, why do you say that? They said because Yachty has already talked to him about, hey, man, I'm not going to be here. They're going to be looking for a catcher. You'd be a perfect fit down here. Wilson Contreras where, where have I read with those before? freaking bats with the birds on the end of it is enough to make me vomit. Double birds, man. Double birds. It's enough to make me vomit. What do you think about that? Well, you're already making Cubs Twitter vomit. Uh, I've seen... <laughs> I seen uh, some aggregation of your uh, comments. It was on your recap that we discussed, and uh, the, the initial reaction, man, is is a lot of people there. They are they are none too pleased with that that possibility, and uh, I I definitely think, man, I didn't know like you, I didn't understand the extent of it was that he's actually talked to Contreras as you just said. That's really interesting. Not it's not like they had a meeting sure. with the GM. It's they yeah, have a mutual respect. Hey, man, you ought to look at us. You remember when they went back and forth on Twitter a few years back uh, where Yachty <laughs> took him out of context? It was right before he started making all-star teams. Yeah. And and uh, he was saying something about Yachty and Posey, and he was saying that, he wants that that's me. That, that, I want to be the best. I want to be better than these guys or something like that. They took it like he – Yachty took it like he thought he was saying he was better than them already. And right. what did he do? He wound up actually replacing them as the starter in the all-star, in the all-star game. game three times since then. Um, but they got close after that because he made a point to go to the audience. And say, That's not what I meant. They cleared the air and became close since then. So, And I've watched them. I've literally watched it happen uh, before games where they're off in a corner talking. And that's probably the context that you're bringing Man, up. Man, if you hit free agency, you should look at this situation. I'm not going to be here. They're going to be looking for somebody. Yeah. Yachty's got exactly. clout, man. I know, like you're saying, Yachty Molina, he's retiring. He's got clout, but he's retiring. So him saying that isn't going to take the Cardinals front office and be like, oh, Yachty said it, we're going to do it then. But Yachty saying that I think carries some weight in the shoes of a, any free agent, but, you know, Wilson Contreras in this, this sense, the comp and the catcher and everything. Like, if he's telling you that, it's something that uh, I don't want to speak for Wilson Contreras, but you might be like, huh, like, like uh, that's really – which is really interesting all around, I think, that that would be a case. Well, the other thing you guys are leaving out of this is Yachty's telling him what it's like to be there. Right. And what hey, the, you'd and, love it here. And that the fans will love him and that, the, and, and that the, the internal environment is a place that he would be comfortable and fit. And I think that's true. Just in some of the casual conversations I've had with Wilson, I think he would be a good fit there. I think he knows that. That market, and much as I despise the St. Louis Cardinals— I dislike three teams in sports. Dis, I mean. Michigan? Uh, no. Oh, Mr. Ohio State guy over here. <laughs> Ohio I'm rooting State. for Ohio State. <laughs> yes. I hope they win 79 to nothing on Saturday. <laughs> I dislike Notre Dame football. Not the basketball. Their coach is a friend of mine. The football Not team. Not Jeff Smarger. And that arrogant ass fan base that they have. I can't <laughs> oh, stand them. Man, you're right about that. I cannot stand the Green Bay Packers. But at the top of the freaking heap is the St. Louis Cardinals. And I have respect, utmost respect, for how they conduct their business. I just hope they never score another run in the history of the franchise. 
I don't like them. <laughs> so, what, 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 Wilson Contreras way, that, in that uniform, enough to make me puke. You know, I grew up hating the Yankees just because you either loved the Yankees or you hated the Yankees. So I hated the Yankees. Where, where are you following the Yankees? No, nothing? I like actually there? love the Yankees. My yeah. mom's okay. from New My late mother's from New York. So... And then Girardi was the manager, so, so you, how could I not like so that? So you're all over the evil empire and their former Darth Vader boss. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, the, the, the small market uh, team up in the woods in Wisconsin, you don't, you don't, you hate them and, and you hate the little birdie, birdie guys. Yeah, the birdie Saturday. guys, I can't stand those Cardinals. Mm-hmm. Can't stand them. Okay. Now, Notre Dame, I get. Notre Dame is, that, that's bigger evil empire than the Yankees. The worst. So the Wilson Contreras conundrum. It, it seems like he and David Ross are in a much better place over the last two or three years than they were when Rossi got named the manager. Mm-hmm. It didn't seem to be, and I've never asked Ross, didn't seem like they had this, like, oh, my God, like Ross and Rizzo were, they were bros. They're, they're totally different people who approach things differently within mm-hmm. the team framework. And and I and I think if if you, since... Rossi became the manager. If you listen when he's been asked about Wilson, you get different answers than when he was asked about other guys. I'll give you the perfect example about this because I expected to get a softball answer to what I thought was a softball question on a big topic, right? So last year when Rizzo and Bryant and Baez were all on on the trade block and we all knew it, we all knew they were gone and it came to the point of even the manager was acknowledging that likelihood and that he'd had conversations with these guys. And so his response to would you re-sign these guys was I, I would, or, or who, who of them would you re-sign? I would re-sign all of them. I'd give them whatever they wanted, but it's not my money. Ask him the same thing about Wilson in April or May, very early in the season, but when we knew the writing was on the wall. This year. This year thinking I'm going to tee it up for him to give me the same answer because I'm writing about it anyway, so I'll see what he says. He did not go there. He, he sort of al- almost awkwardly uh, uh, you know, said, talked about it being somebody else's decision and what a, what a question that was at this time and that kind of thing. And I said, well, I asked the same thing about the other guys last year, and you, you said that. But it, it speaks to an entirely different relationship in a way that he views him versus the others. So I, 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 that's the way I took it at that time. And for you to bring this subject up now, it just reminded me of that. Well, I mean, I'll give Ross, maybe, maybe I'm totally off base. I'll give him some benefit of the doubt in the sense that when did you ask about the three, get the three guys that got traded? It was closer to the deadline last okay. year. That's so, so that's interesting. Let's just say June. Okay. Well, June, I think there might I remember that quote. Well, June, it was almost like, I don't think I expected all three to get traded until down to the wire. I feel like in June, you may have thought, we knew Brian was Brian, right? But Rizzo or Baez, perhaps. Rizzo shut down talks. So but, but Rizzo had already been made an offer yeah. that, that year, within months before that. And yeah. Javi was pretty surprising the moment to me, as much as there's no reason to go halfway like that all makes sense. What if, I mean, they might just all have been on the same page from the get-go this year. What did, can you guys talk Oh, about? I agree with that. Yeah, I, so, I don't. I, I, that's one hundred percent true. They did not even engage in in a in a in a word, much less a sentence or a paragraph of discussions before the season started. Yeah, so I feel like or before might, the lockout, right? So it's kind of like it might. They be, got to the eleventh hour of arbitration. They took. They were willing to take him to the hearing until the night before. Right. Yeah. So I feel like in that sense, maybe it's just the circumstances were more painted on already. Almost like like. He talked in spring training, Contreras, about, you wrote, I think your headline always sticks in my mind, Contreras' dream of free agency would be Cubs nightmare, I think. And, like, mm-hmm. he talked about, yeah, you know, like, like he, what do you say, he was looking forward to yeah, it. Yeah, in, in, in a way, uh, being a free agent would be a dream come true. You get, you get you know, pe- people want you, and then you get to make choices. So he was talking about that. that in March. He was talking that way. Because he knew what was coming. Exactly. So that's kind of where I'm wondering, like, as, ter- as far as the, uh, how they're talking about him as a perspective guy you build around or retain, like maybe I think it might've been a different circumstance almost because maybe from the get go this year, it was kind of like that the, the, the cock is ticking. So d- do you think there's any chance the Cubs make an offer to him? I think there's a chance. I think it's a very, very small chance. Um, the way my read is, 
uh, talking to people around the situation is that uh, he'll go to free agent. They'll make him a qualifying offer. He'll turn it down. Um, now he'll go into free agency. And uh, you remember when Dexter Fowler got that offer from Baltimore? Mm-hmm. There was a qualifying offer attached to him at the time. Um, but he got a three-year, what was it, 30 33. million? Three-year or 30-something million dollar offer. And it looked like it was, it was reported as a done deal. Correct. And then there was something, I don't know if there was something in the, somebody questioned something in the physical or something, but at any rate, it wasn't a done deal. And the next thing you know, surprise, he shows up at Cubs camp and he signs a one-year deal uh, with the Cubs. They kept in touch with him all the way through the process, and I don't think they thought they were going to get him up until that last minute. If it happens with Contreras that he comes back or just even that they make him an offer, it's going to be because he doesn't get the offers that he anticipates on the market, and at some point they re-engage. Uh, but that's going to mean, just consider this for a minute. That means that his price comes back toward their price, and it means that they engineered it, at least in part, because of the qualifying offer. And if I'm the player, that chaps my ass from the start. <laughs> So I might tell you to go screw yourself, even if it gets there at that point, because you you screwed me in the first place on it. I'll go take this other offer out here. And what if they say, because they're not played by the system that you guys approve. Fine, But that's how you treated me. And you also didn't discuss extension for a year plus prior to that. You, you, You were about to take me to an arbitration hearing after everything that we've been through together for what amounted to a couple of bucks when you weren't anywhere near a financial issue. On the your- White Sox were 50 grand apart with Lucas Giolito. Yeah. yeah, this is, this is. Uh, no, they did offer him an extension of now, 50 million for four years. Let's be clear about this. <laughs> MLB puts pressure on teams to, to draw hard lines on this stuff because they don't like how salaries can go incrementally up because people get in the arbitration process and say, well, big deal. It's only 50 grand or a hundred grand or 250 grand or 500 grand. And, and so the team the gives over it. effect. And then so now that 500 is 750 next time with the next comp guy that comes along and so on and so forth. So MLB is saying, hold the line on the increments. You're the Chicago freaking <laughs> Cubs with a relationship with a guy that was a rookie catcher for you in the first championship that you won in 108 years. I'm going to give him another million. Screw you, MLB. This is different. This isn't, this isn't Ian Happ. A year and a half ago. Correct. This, this is Wilson Contreras now in his final year of arbitration, who I might want to extend my relationship with. You know, it's uh, interesting. You, you talk about the qualifying offer and then coming back perhaps, right? It's made me think because Fowler got after 15 before he was he came back in that surprise move with the Cubs in spring training. The qualifying offer he got offered was 15.8 or so, and then he signed one year for 13. Mm-hmm. So I think the qualifying offer this year is – expected to be i don't know if it's been set 18 yet. million or there about 18, 19, probably, something probably like 19 that. might even uh, my get my best guess is it goes a tick over 19 so i mean which is twice as much as he's making now right so assuming he were he would turn that down and assuming you know they offer it to him as you know they'll sitting, turn it down right so, so assuming ball and like like we we expect um i mean if you're talking like you you kind of perked my ears up when you said okay then come back closer to their price like 16 for four or five or something like i don't know if that gets it done i don't know if that's i don't know so, so what happens to ian hap then he's got another year of control <laughs> one year of control I, they, I don't think there's any doubt that they talk to him this winter to extend they they see what it takes they're gonna talk to um nico right and is and that kind of the expectation and, and they'll certainly talk to nico too. okay so if they said to ian hap four for 40 you think he does it no no hell no would you what's he making now Six and change, he'll he'll go up to nine, nine plus yeah. four for fifty. And I don't think they're going much higher than that. Well, I fifty don't. closer, but still probably not. If if I'm him, you got to remember. So he's wife is from here. He wants to be here. He's got business interests in the city. Yeah, the thing that the thing I that think you, he works with them to get it I done. I think he works with them, but so, some of the stuff that 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 you that you sometimes ignore when we start talking about these other factors, and I'll give you those factors, is is that these guys often get one chance in their careers, if they're lucky to capitalize on their talent or a, a breakout season or two, 
for a multi-year long-term deal that, that's going to be their big payday. And especially nowadays in the game when the 30-somethings are getting squeezed out. And now, by the way, we've got minor leaguers are about to, to unionize and we've got young players that have this bonus pool money in. And what's happening? What are we seeing happen? Julio Rodriguez in Seattle gets this very creative contract that could pay him as much as $470 million or over, what, 17 years or something like that? It's crazy. And, and we see what the Braves are doing with guys like Michael Harris, who's got like two, three months in the big leagues. What's happening is that even more money is skewing now towards some of these younger players, in part because they've been fighting for this. What's that going to do to the 32-year-olds of the world? They're going to get squeezed even more because the luxury tax still exists. My point is, is this, now that I've put everybody to sleep on the podcast, <laughs> is that this guy gets one chance to do this, He's got one more year left. If they come at him cheap, low ball, why the hell would he take that? Why wouldn't he go one more year with the club through arbitration and then maximize? And if they want to talk to him, then fine. Give me a market value. He knows the business of the game better than anybody else. He's the one that's been on front lines in the CBA negotiations. Yeah, I'm guessing $12 million a year, he might take it. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't touch that if I'm him. He just... He's a switch hitting power hitter. You know how many guys have hit, say, 300 home runs as switch hitters in the history of the league? Six, something like that. So, something enormously small like that. Like, like, and he's got a chance to do something like that. He's got a chance to be what very few guys in the league are. He's really valuable if he's what he is this year. And there's people in the game that say he's given up a little power to be more consistent from both sides of the plate this year, and they love it. People in the game with money to spend on players like that, who I've talked to, love that about him. This guy's market's going to grow. Yeah, I'm a huge Ian Happ guy. I, I win with guys like that. Yes. He's never going to lead the league in hitting. He's never going to lead the league in home runs. He's, He's a winning a player for who's an awesome person. And what's he done for you in left field this year when you've just left him? He's become very good. Very solid. I, I'm not, I'm not going to say he should win a gold glove or anything like that, but, but he... Plays balls out out there. He he and and by the way, have you seen him at the? Have you seen him on on balls at the wall? He is he is almost like a ballerina out there. He's good. He's learned to play the brick wall. He's a stud, man. I he's, I. It's, that's the kind of person I want in my organization. Yeah, and he's really smart. He's a good dude, and he does care about making the whole uh, better than the, than the than the parts. I think he could easily get Schwarber money if he does what he did this year. Oh, uh, totally. Next year. Totally. Also, because he does more than Schwarber does. Right. He's a three and a half B war player this year, and he's probably going to finish closer to four, right? I, I'm not good at how war is calculated, so I, maybe I'm totally off base, but he's going to finish probably around four. And uh, like you said, he's, I mean, he's already got 15 home runs. He sacrificed some power this year, more contact, cutting down the strikeouts. If he finishes with 20 home runs, and he's going to have new career high in RBIs. OPS plus is probably going to be a, close to a career high. Like, if he, does, if he does that again next year, you could. I don't. I'm really bad at predicting. But you contracts. sign this winner, you take all the pressure off of next year. Yeah, it's, yeah, for sure. Uh, you get married, and you go. We got fifty million coming. That's why he's so interesting, man. His market, like, I, like when you said four hundred and fifty, and I said closer, I immediately regretted that only because his market is going to be so hard to predict. Like what his value is, and it's going to be bigger than that. Well, what you're saying, what teams might value him at? It's because what he's done this year, this calendar year, dating back to last August to now. And if he does it again next year, that's only going to make it go higher. But, you know, obviously we want to see it again next year. But what he's done this year, you've already got a pretty large sample size from the last 12 months. So he could get – right now I think he's going to – he's putting himself in position to make good money. But how much bigger could that be? We're talking next August if he's still let here. Let me give you a comp. Let me, let me give you this comp as a question. Who's better right now? Who do you like as a better player going into next season – Ian Happ or Seiya Suzuki? Wow, that's a great question. They're the uh, same age. I would probably, if I had to bet on one guy, probably Seiya. Okay, but it's close, right? It is. Look what Seiya makes. Seiya makes 17 a year, but it's more than that in what it costs the Cubs, what the Cubs invested in him because they had to pay the posting. He was a five-year, $100 million guy. There's your benchmark. Now, I'm not saying he gets that or asks for that or, or it will, he might take a little less, but that's your benchmark. And by the way, 
I guarantee you he's thought of this. You know why? Because I've asked him about it. So he, <laughs> we've had these conversations. He doesn't give me answers on all of it, but I know it's gone through his mind because I put it there. So th- this is these are this is his market, right? These are the things that are going to go through his mind, and you're not going to get him for four and fifty. No, that's just that's he's he's going to get close to that AAV in arbitration, th- his final year of arbitration, and then he goes from there. All right, gentlemen, I'm off to guaranteed rate to host unfiltered. What do you gentlemen have on the docket? I think I'm going to take a nap. I got, I got one more quick question for you. Cubs have used 60 players this year. Last year was a franchise record and MLB record, right? 69, was it? Oh, nice. Um, do they do – No. They, do they don't match that? No. Are there nine more players? I can name at least two I could see. Wisniewski? And Alzelay. Alzelay probably comes back. That's two. Some people are probably immediately going Maybe to Maybe Brennan Davis. Maybe. I've mentioned Davis as – Possibly a needle threading guy that could maybe get in Matt Mervis. Hand. See, I was gonna say people are probably going there, but people want to see Mervis play at three levels this year. I'm already. not sure. It's probably not. So, I mean, if we really tried hard, we could probably come up with two more names. Ben Brown. Ben Brown. A couple pitchers would be the guys, right? And they can. And this isn't like past years. And people probably need to know this if they're thinking, well, rosters expand in a couple of days. Yeah, rosters expand by two this year. You don't. You can't bring the whole forty-man roster up like you used to be able to. And they have two guys who aren't on the forty-man right now as substitute players, who in theory you could see sticking around and being those guys. Because At least one of them. I'm not sure what the Rule Five implications are. I'm sure people listening are like you. Like they probably might, they might know. I haven't looked into that, but there's definitely a lot of guys uh, that they they have to consider getting looks at before Rule Five. Decision well, they have a lot comes. of guys that got put on forty man, right? And if, if they want to look at them exactly. ahead of time, yeah. So there's true. there's a hand. That's where I'm coming in with. Like there are guys like that, but you have a forty man crunch as it is. So I say no, they fall short. I'd say like sixty five is probably where I'd fall. Yeah, yeah, sixty five, and that's you know, that's good news, right? You don't want that record. No, no. it's a bad record to have. All the right. fact that they're even in the ballpark for it means too. That's kind of a good thing. Have a wonderful day. You too, man. We will see you guys next week. Enjoy your Labor Day holiday. Go Buckeyes. Yeah, absolutely. Point for spread <laughs> is 17 and a half. I, I think they win by like 11. I would, I, whenever I see those, Ohio State always fails against good teams to really to cover that. They're always under. I hope it's didn't, didn't one of my 74 guys nothing. go in there and beat your ass last year? That was so depressing. Who beat them? Oregon. Oregon. At their place. Their defense That's could it. not stop anybody last year. All right, you guys have a great day. For Claire, for Tim, for Gordon, I'm Cap. Have a great rest of your day. It's all brought to you by Tastyworks on the Cubs Talk Podcast. Take that.